almost feel bad for these two words that in my title, I had to defend them, <laughs> right? Like Doug Peabody is speaking next door, by the way, I kind of recommend you go over there at some point and leave this room because he's talking about his 2112 picks and all the X's and O's that he does, which I've had to deal with for 19 years as a coach, primarily a defensive minded coach dealing with his, um, his X's and O's. And so here I am having to defend like, oh, also um, these things kind of matter too. Like, please consider thinking about them. So <laughs> thank you for being here and for taking this seriously. So this is not intentional. I'd, did not know exactly what he was talking about. Um, I'm gonna pick up where he left off and begin at the end, at the very end of the season. And what I'm gonna start off with, <clears throat> um, this is a piece I wrote for, for PCA a few years back. Four years ago, I decided to go out and be an assistant coach. So here I am, I've been a coach for 19 years and I'm starting off talking about the one year I was an assistant coach for a soccer team. I really liked the head coach, our core values were aligned, and I wanted to kind of step back and see what other coaches were doing and, and sort of be allowed into this other family and look at best practices and best principles. And uh, there were some really interesting things that came out of it. I highly recommend this if you have the time. I, I did not have the time, but I did it anyway. And here's some things that came out of this. So what I want, what I want to look at is, um, and again, I do, I really like, Wade's focus on best principles from best practices, so you can keep that in mind here. And um, the, the thing that I want to start with is the end of the season and honoring what you value. You're going to see this theme a lot today, honoring what you value and looking at the team banquet. Because what this coach was doing and what we do at our own banquets is this is an amazing time to say to everyone, parents, siblings, friends, players. We've been through a lot the past three, six, nine months. And here's, here's what we value. And you may not be saying it explicitly, but you're saying it through your actions, how you're rewarding players, what it is that you're doing. And so there's a great example from this particular soccer team. This coach, after every game, when he broke down the game, always included the bench players. Hey, bench players, loved your guys' energy. Thanks again for reminding me about the, the weak side player. You know, great job picking up your team when we were down. And I was thinking, like, is this, like, is this lip service? Is he trying to be inclusive? What's going on here? At the CIF, our section, CCS, semifinal game, we're down one to nothing. The game's coming to a close. There's that weird soccer thing where you never know how much time is left. The clock keeps running when the ball goes out of bounds. There may or may not be extra minutes. So the bench players self-organize, right? We're losing one to nothing with about 10 minutes later. The coach didn't say, I want you guys to, he's coaching the game. And the bench players circle the field. We're playing up in San Francisco. And every time the ball went out of bounds, they're sprinting to the ball to give it to their team because the other team in soccer, the ball goes out. You walk over, the clock's winding down because you're winning and you get the ball. We were getting the ball to them immediately. We score a goal with literally no time on the clock. We score the goal, the referee blows the whistle, end of the game, we end up winning the game in the shootout. The, the culture that that coach had created for the bench players literally made them part of the team. And that is the primary reason we won. There was a guy who kicked the ball into the rectangle who would not have had that chance if the entire year the bench players hadn't felt empowered like they were truly part of the team. And that's one of the big things that he celebrated at the banquet. Not so much the guy who kicked the ball in the rectangle. That's great, the papers wrote about that. He got awards and plaques, but this. At that same game, and we're gonna come back to this, the roots of competition, not really the way it's viewed, in secular society, but striving together. One of the other things he focused on is our goalkeeper. <clears throat> I was in charge of the goalies here on the soccer team. Nolan, we won that game penalty shootouts. It was tied after regulation, tied after sudden death, sudden victory. And we won on penalty shootouts. Our goalie made three huge saves. Good coaching, I suppose. <laughs> And what does he do? Does he run out to be hoisted on the shoulders of his team to celebrate? Runs over to the opposing goalie who's sitting in the corner who blatantly made an error in one of the shots. 
and put his arms around him and talk to him for 30 seconds. And what did the coach celebrate at the banquet? The saves that he made? No, everyone saw those. The paper wrote about those. Celebrated the character of the goalie. These are the things that are being highlighted at the end of a tremendous win-loss, medals, et cetera, a year. And so that one big thing that I would urge coaches is take advantage of this opportunity. You've just had a team together for months upon months pouring their hearts into this venture. Frame to them what you guys just did because everyone in the program is listening. So the last thing, and I get to pick up again on what, um, what Wade was saying, Awards question mark. You heard him talk about the awards. We in 19 years have not given an award. Again, because I'm trying to celebrate what it is that our team values. And I'll come back to our team motto, be your best, not be the best. It's an important distinction that I borrowed from Aristotle, which I will share. Be your best. Be together as a team. Do this as a team. If you want to go back to the soccer paradigm, bring the bench players in. We're all in this together. And now, end of the season, congratulations. You were more valuable than all of you. Here's your MVP. But, but, but we all did it together. You guys are all equally important. But here's your most valuable plaque. Now, th this may feel like the sort of the other end of the everyone gets a trophy spectrum. Like, oh, everyone in the team is going to be hurt because they're not valuable and this player is. And it's, re it's really not that. I'm, I'm completely OK with the top players getting all league and all section and all American. Like, those are well-deserved awards. But to bring a team together at the end of a year if your motto and your goal has anything to do with inclusion and doing it as a team, and then to single out a single player as more valuable than all the other players, that, that to me feels like the opposite of the culture that we're creating and celebrating. And so we've never, and first year I got pushed back. Wait, no, who's the MVP? Why no MVP? It's the opposite of our culture. I don't, I, that's what, I mean, that's, it's actually a really easy answer. The one thing we do reward, I give two plaques, typically two, sometimes three, team captain. At the beginning of the year, after we've gone through our preseason paradise week, not hell, paradise, we, we elect captains. And I say, pick the guys that best emulate our team goal, be your best, and who can best represent you to me, to the referees, to the community, because they're going to be doing things on behalf of our team. They can be freshmen, seniors, starters, non-starters. Last year, our, our team elected a non-starter, which I, which I love because that's what they're voting on. And so that's what we honor. At the end of the year, we do give two plaques. I'm gonna call the captains up that were chosen by the players that emulate what our team stands for. And then lastly, this is a really tricky one under this banner, but the way that we approach statistics, because you've got to keep goals and assists. You've got to report that to the papers, and when you go to those funky all-league meetings, you have to say, my player scored 93 goals, and yours only scored 92, so he should be first team. You've got to keep the stats, because we, we have to play that game somewhat. But one of my favorite statistics, and again, this is the statistic that we highlight at the end of the season banquet, which is borrowed from ice hockey and now used in basketball a lot, is the plus minus statistic. And actually, John Vargas did this for a year going into the 2000 Olympics as just another metric. And it's a pretty simple stat to take, but it captures exactly what I think we want to be celebrating as coaches, not who's the guy throwing the ball into the rectangle. That's important, he's gonna get the goal. And not necessarily the guy who made the pass, that's important. How about the guy, now I was a goalie, but I occasionally go out in the field with my team, which I don't know how we get people to play out in the field, quite frankly. It's just, it's, it is exhausting. So there you are, sitting on the weak side flat, you've been sloughed off and you realize you've, you've gotta get over here, come over your hips, buzz down to the opposite wing, all so that Pete can pass the ball to Joe and get a goal and everyone cheers for Joe. And you're down here in the corner exhausted. And the only reason that Joe got to score is because Pete did a good job setting the goalie and giving him a perfect pass. And Jack, in this made up case, was willing to drive all the way across the offense, stick himself in the deepest part of the offense to open that play up. And the plus minus stat rewards that. We all, because we all scored, we all get plus one. Everyone who is in while you're scoring gets plus one, and while you're getting scored on, negative one. So you could, you could lose a game by three, but still finish you know, plus two if, if while you were in, the team was, had scored two more goals than were scored against you. And it's not a perfect statistic in any way, shape, or form, along with all the other statistics. But what it does is it highlights what we value. And that's the guy that we get to celebrate at the banquet. And that's the one stat 
that stays in our record books and never leaves. And this year it was actually a non-starter. Nicholas Hernandez will be, he was second off the bench, will be in our team record books for all of time. Because all time goal scorers get bumped down and bumped off the list. But every year we leave the plus minus, the top three plus minus. And again, it's, it's our way of sending a message and saying, this is, this is actually, we have to do this. This is the important stuff. And that's, that's the messaging that we're doing. So what do we get from this kind of a focus? You get better results. <laughs> You win the soccer game, you got guys driving across, doing the miserable work to open up, uh, open up the goal. The students are grasping the big picture. And again, coming off the heels of that last talk, that is far and away what's important to me. I, I've, my, my wife said you can only say this comment once because it gets kind of annoying. But, so here's my once. Um, if all I were doing were teaching children how to throw a ball into a floating rectangle, or keep it out, as the case may be. This would not be a very worthwhile venture, especially at the level that we're coaching. Maybe when you get up to college, professional sports, the Olympics, but at the youth level, we have a chance to really impart big picture stuff. And this mindset, this approach allows us to do this while winning and it's more fun, which is what we're told is why we're out here. So secondly, some ways of thinking about doing this, and it involves what I think some emotional risk taking, which especially for the coach of, of a team of adolescent boys is a really fun area to, to break into because they're not conditioned to do this. So one of the things, and actually I'm gonna go back to that because before we get to this, um, one of the things that we do at the beginning of every year is our Paradise Week. I say paradise, I guess I have to, since I know it's not conventional. It started out hell week, I changed it to heck week for metaphysical issues to avoid the term hell. And then it became paradise week because I realized, wait a minute, like if we're telling these young men that this is hell or heck or bad, they're with all their buddies playing the sport they love, being pushed in order to be the best they can possibly be, they're in for a long hundred years before it's all over. So it is now paradise week and at paradise week, at every practice, typically following a really grueling test set. I've borrowed all the test sets that we did from the 96 Olympic team. I was copiously taking notes as Sean and I were sitting out, kind of helping the, you know, running the clock and hanging out together as the backup goalies. And we do these brutally difficult test sets and then appreciate. And what this means, I have to lay it out a little um, more clearly the first time around, is grab the guy next to you, what do you appreciate about each other? And the very first year I did this 19 years ago with the 16 year old boys, they were like <laughs> <laughs> And now they love it. And there's almost always an odd player out and here I am talking to some 15 year old who's sitting here and they're amazingly eloquent because they're getting the chance to do this and you to them. And at the end of that nine days of training, Everyone's had that connection. Everyone has spent a minute together. Everyone on the team, starters, backup, goalie, freshmen, taking a risk, looking someone in the eye, saying, you know what I appreciate about you? And it's hardly ever your ability to throw the ball into the goal. It's usually something really big and important. And now these guys are creating that culture of trust where they know this guy's got their back because they've shared that moment. And something else that we do uh, before we get to team dinners is we do a, refre a reflection of gratitude. And we sit together and take turn, one player will, it, you could call it a prayer. I, I, I don't, so that I, I'm trying not to force religious beliefs or non-beliefs on people. It's a reflection of gratitude. This is a chance for one player at every dinner to say, here's what I'm grateful for. Here are the things I appreciate about you guys. And it's always the really big picture stuff. And here they are, we just finished a practice. We got 20 guys holding hands, sharing gratitude about their ability to be on this team, to be together, to just reflect on what it is, the opportunity that we have. I mean, we're, we're playing a sport that we love together. Like, Right there, I, could, I don't know what the socioeconomic status is of your team, you've got something to be profoundly grateful for. And that sets an amazing foundation. And so, again, yes, these are best practices. 
maybe, I mean, I, I really liked the idea of, of going on the football field or, you know, doing a walk around. Randy Burgess had us do a, we went up and down the stairs that we ran every, um, every heck week. And uh, we did that as a, as a team. We did one yellow brick road together, right? So something where you're reflecting, and, and again, I, I think it's taking that a little bit of an emotional risk because for most young people, like that's gonna feel a little bit risky. And now you've taken that risk together and now we can get into the culture of trust. So one of the other things that we do to sort of foster this, I'm you know, again saying taking more risks together is read articles. And here's just an example of one. Um, it's written from a goalie's perspective, but what it means to trust your teammate. And again, this is a teammate who you've now appreciated and you've shared gratitude with and you've taken these risks with. And now we look at what it really means to trust someone and how that goes along with the inevitable failure that's coming your way. So here's a great photo um, from that article um, <clears throat> where you can see like the goalie here is really trusting in this hand. Like he is not even gonna spend an inkling of energy worried here. And this player, actually he went off to play at Berkeley, it was a national champion, he just finished his senior year season at Hopkins. And this field player is saying, look, I can't cover this whole 30 square foot object. I'm willing to take off these three square feet and that's all I got. And I'm gonna trust in you. And one of us occasionally is going to fail. And this is a really fun chance for me to start with goalies and talk about their leadership role and to say, look, you're going to let this shot in at some point. And what you need to make sure you do is say to Nick and the team, hey guys, that's mine, Nick, great arm. Because this does two things. One, it tells Nick, next time in this situation, don't, don't change things up and try to block everything because now you're blocking nothing and we can get into that whole philosophical issue. So it tells him he, he did it correctly, but more importantly, hey team, I'm not here to place blame. We're on a team, we've all got responsibilities. Nick did his, mine was an easy keep your shoulder square, hips up, two hands smothered out in front that I failed to do. So that's mine. And now next time around, 30 minutes later in your training, Nick's gonna have the wrong hand up. This guy's gonna score this goal. And when Spencer says, hey, Nick, you guys, in that situation, we need shot blocker taking cross cage. Everyone knows, Spencer's not blaming Nick. Sorry, you just, you're gonna get the brunt of everything today. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer's not blaming Nick, saying, hey, that was his, guys. Not my fault. Everyone knows, oh yeah, Spencer's already taken accountability for the shots that were his. That's right, when the ball get, gets swung here and we're guarding with our hips here, we take off cross cage. Right, and then we're all on the same page, growing together, it's a team defense. And again, that's, the, that's a cultural thing that goes in line very much with the X's and O's based on that sense of trust, which I love this video, it's just a few weeks ago, and I don't know anything, I don't watch college basketball, but I got to imagine there's some sort of semblance of trust here, where his teammate, who can come over to another 20-year-old man and say, hey, grab his face, get your head up. I, I, don't know what he, I don't even know what happened. I gotta imagine that guy just made some terrible mistake, missed the ball he was supposed to throw into the little circle or something, <laughs> right? As Buddy runs over and sees him hunched down and has the confidence that this guy's not gonna go, get away from me, you're making me look like a bull. Something's happened where he is in a culture that he's allowed to go up to a teammate, grab his face, put his head up, and send a message. And they talk about having a team that's more fun, I don't know why I put it in quotes, that's more fun to be on. That's a more fun team to be on. A team where you're not blaming, but you're working together when the shot went in cross cage or near side. And better results. So this is, the, this is the importance of culture. So we'll read a lot of sports related stuff, but I'd say even more importantly is the non-sports related stuff that we read. So this is an article that we read four years ago, Love People, Not Pleasure. I read it the day prior to practice. I said, wow, 
print it, send, send it to all the, t the players on the team. We had a great um, weight training session, and the, the players were assigned to read this for homework. This has nothing, to, sports is not mentioned in this article. And after we lifted weights together for an hour, we all sat together and had a great conversation. We had starters with second strings, seniors with freshmen, goalies with centers. Again, kind of going back to that, I appreciate philosophy and approach. And we're all talking about, I mean, look at the themes that came up. The importance of relationships. How to balance in your life, and also we talked, it came up about water polo, contentment versus ambition. Our base desires versus long-term long deep fulfillment. Societal versus personal family values. I mean, this is one of the things that comes up a lot when we talk, you know, going back to, to the MVP award or the way that we look at statistics and the plus minus or all these other things that, are we gonna value what society is valuing or is there something deeper that our program values? So we had this great conversation. Again, very little to do about water polo, but certainly our team culture came up again and again. And Eric said, wow, there, I have never experienced anything like this. We have created our own little society where we can hug each other and say I appreciate this and have a kind of scary conversation and share where I failed and talk about long-term, deep-rooted joy. And he called it a little society, which I think is a better term than culture. Culture sometimes, I, I actually love this term, but you gotta dig really deep to get to the roots of that. And it sometimes gets muddy and politicized. This, like this is what we, the adult, the professional in charge, we get to create that. We get to set the stage for that. And I just loved the way that big, strong Eric said this. He's like, wow, we're, we're like our own little society here. And so to take that on our shoulders as coaches, um, I think is, is really empowering and it's motivating. And I started the term off on the heels of the talk we just heard, it's, it's inspirational. And that, that's a, that to me is probably the most fun part of coaching that I can imagine. And I, and I mentioned the term competition very early on and breaking that down and looking at this idea of striving together. And again, this is something that's different from society, right? Our little society, our culture really takes that striving together to heart. Now, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that we're just going out and we're not really trying to win. Our, our competitor, the person, the team with whom we're striving, is actually expecting us to come out and try our darndest to beat them. So there, there's a little bit of a semantic shift here, but there's also some other ways to celebrate this, right? Like you hear a lot of like, oh, they crushed them, oh, they dominated, oh, we're gonna school you, these guys suck, right? The language that kind of goes in to taking on a competitor head to head and just changing that conversation a little bit. And one way that we do this, uh, here we are with Coronado. Um, every year we host Coronado for a game and these games end up being really, t I mean, Coronado is one of the top, I don't even, I even need to say anything about Coronado, one of the top high school programs of the past 40 years. Um, almost every year it's about a one goal game. Two years ago it went into overtime. Last year we were up by seven and Coach Burgess and Sean switched things up and the Menlo coach was too slow to follow and they closed it within one. Right? These amazing battles. And then we go sit and dine together, bless you. And we share food together. We hold hands and have a, a reflection of gratitude together. And it all comes back to a foundation that we build with Coronado when we fly down and we stay with their families in the summer for four days. And we train with them the ungodly Burgess hour of 445. And we, we do all this with them. And these guys, Menlo and Coronado players, over the last 15 years have become like, they're, they're all buddies. They're staying at each other's homes, they're going on vacations together, they're starting businesses together. And so looking at that relationship, and that doesn't mean we're coming out and taking it easy on each other. These are phenomenal, high level, really intense games. But all the while, we recognize that we are striving together with them, that we're in this together. And again, that's somewhat counterculture, but you wanna talk about a really rich experience, this is the lens to view that through. And so, I, 
I couldn't not have the following video, which I'll show you here um, next. I think it best captures and emulates this whole approach. Uh, <clears throat> the book that John mentioned, um, Sports Ethics and Leadership, that came out, um, was a lot about sports ethics. And I sometimes think eth ethics gets watered down, not watered down, um, gets this view of the ethical policemen and like, you should not do that, and that was unethical. And that, that's part of it, and that's kind of fun in a weird way, like finding the gray area of rules, et cetera. Um, but, but I feel like morally praiseworthy acts, super erogatory acts is the sort of annoying, pedantic term for it, right? The, the acts that go above and beyond, the really inspirational stuff, often gets overlooked. Like to lead an ethical life is not to just follow the rules and not steal that and not punch him and not cheat. Like that's, that's not really living an ethical life. That's just not doing bad stuff sometimes to people. <laughs> um, but like the, the important sense of, of leading a moral life, I think really should involve, and this is, I went to my editors, I said, look, I, I can't have this book only be about that. I've gotta finish the book. With, and there, there are so many great examples. So here, here is one. Um, to frame this really briefly, when you hit a home run in baseball or softball, after it goes over the fence, right? You hit the ball with the little stick. It goes over the fence. You have to run around and touch the four magic areas. So it's not just water polo. That's got some silliness to it. You have to touch all four bases. Then you get the point, the run. And if you should trip and shred your ACL, and you're writhing in pain on the ground and can't move, if your teammates touch you, you're out. It's an odd thing, and if they want to put someone in to touch the areas for you, it only counts as a single. So you may know this, being America's pastime. The other really nice insight behind this story is the woman who hits the home run, it's the last game of her career. It's her senior year championship game, fifth inning. So quite possibly her last at bat. She's never hit a home run in her entire career. Team's down by two. She's up to bat, hits a home run, running around first base. And you can imagine, like, I, she's never done, what do I do? You run and you're excited and you're gonna do, <laughs> crumples to the ground, debilitated in pain. Teammates can't touch her. Okay, so that's about as inspired as I can be in talking about sports. Right, the, the, the two women who carried her, the, their team lost the game by two runs. They essentially went way out of their way. Like, I, I have never heard of anything, it's not like that's, this is not a norm in softball where you carry people around to help them beat you. Right? They went way out of their way. The other team could have just put a pinch run. You know, what's the rule? Oh, uh, you punch run. Okay, single. Okay. So they got a single. And there's a runner on base, so first base goes to second. And instead, they went so far out of the way. Right? Again, for this foundational, because she deserved it. Right? She did the thing that the sport is asking of her. And they went out of their way in striving together. And so, again, like those, those are the kind of things that I'm celebrating. I, I love the, you know, off the quick high corner bar down shot. Like, that, we're going to go crazy for that, too. Like, that's, that fires me up. I want to give goalies their fair due when they get a little piece of that and knock it out of them. We're going to fire, we're going to fire up about that. Um, but this is the, the deep stuff that, as coaches, if this is your lens, right, if this is the lens that you're viewing your team and the sport, and you can impart that lens a little bit, 
so they start seeing this experience through that lens, now you've really taught them something. And so on the heels of this, we want to not just make sure, I've used italics here in my presentation, that our players are accountable. And again, this is where it gets scary. We're asking all of our players to take all these emotional risks that we throw ourselves into that same boat. So Adam snuck in at just the right time. Gosh. Um, it's because, see you buddy, <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, it's because we're such good friends and I respect him so much as a coach that I can start this next slide off with the, it, this is again, this is one of my favorite moments in the sort of history of coaching. Man, you messed up. Dude, I'm so sorry. I thought you were speaking and there's no way you would actually be here. <laughs> so I like this for two reasons. The short story is that you call a timeout when you're not supposed to. You got a penalty shot in like a very important game. That's the short story. The coach made a mistake at the Olympics is the short story. So I, here's what, here's, here's, here are the two things that I love about this story. One, he had created a culture that allowed for people to make mistakes and everyone else to pick that person up without hanging their head, without pointing a finger, without blaming, without throwing in the towel. That culture had been created. We're gonna see, there was a great article that, that involves one of his players that was in the Wall Street Journal a month ago, we're gonna see here in a moment. So that, that culture had already been created. Huge mistake, team got his back, crisis averted. And secondly, and this is maybe the thing I like more about it, Coach, um, when he talks about coaching, he talks about this. He has gold medals upon gold medals upon wins upon wins upon wins to talk about. He could easily not talk about this. Why would you stand up and talk about a failure? Well, my guess is that the culture of that team allows failure and allows everyone to recover from it and have their back. And that is why I will always use this in this talk. So thank you, Adam. So, <laughs> um, so. <laughs> well, you're up here with Steve Young. I mean, I put Steve Young next. <laughs> and so. This article that I, that I referenced, um, and again, it, it mentions the award giving that we have talked about. And um, he, his, the, the author who's, who's done this captain's class organization for the past 15 years says, well, is, isn't there a better way to give awards? But we've already ridden that hobby horse. Moving on to, to what he focuses on is he says, instead of giving the most valuable player award, how about a, some sort of a captain's award? And he, um, he mentions the, one of the key players for the 99 World Cup soccer team, their captain. And just like the All Blacks coach, she's the one going to carry the luggage. She's the one who, as, as the younger players re recount their first travel trip, they get a knock on the door, they're exhausted, they've been traveling and flying. Knock on the door, it's their team captain, a seasoned veteran with their luggage. Message received. You don't need, that's it. You don't need to give a lecture about the importance of leadership. The message has been received because she's on a team <clears throat> with a culture that unlike, and again, we're, we're looking at society's values versus our little society's values, where it's my understanding it's still the case that the younger, weaker players pick up the pool and the seniors, they've earned it. They didn't die, and they're seniors. That's what they've done. They go shower, and they get to go home. Freshmen are picking up the cap. The seniors throw their cap. Message received. They're more important than me. This is not really a team. These guys are first, and we're last. You can imagine how that's going to work out. There was a little bit of pushback 19 years ago. When I arrived at the Menlo School, and day one of practice ended, and the seniors walked off, I said, whoa, let me, let me hear from you guys. What's going on? Oh, yeah, God, the senior, when we were freshmen, they would like push us into the bushes, you know, telling all these stories. Like, oh, well, in our little society, I didn't have that term available for another 14 years until Eric gave it to me. In our culture, I didn't use that term either. Here, here, here that's, that's not how we do things. You guys are 
you're kind of all tied for first here. So, and now through the transmission of culture, I haven't had to say that in, I'd love to know actually the last time I had to say that or have that conversation. I almost kind of miss it. It's a really fun lesson to learn. But instead, and actually more importantly, next year seniors, we just had our first game yesterday. First game of the next year because we, first time we played without our current seniors. Next year seniors are doing that. The big studs are the guys that are carrying the caps and handing the caps out. And the freshmen are seeing the big cool guys on campus and on the team doing this and I'm watching it. Lesson learned. So connecting this with my first example, the other person, he, he said here are six nominees for, for what I think should be like the worldwide captain's award. He gave these two as examples. And he said, what people say of Maggie Steffens, and he had to explain water polo a little bit to Wall Street Journal readers. She's highly energetic and personable, known for being honest about her failures. And she plays under that coach. So somehow this culture has been transmitted and this expert in leadership has seen it and thinks she's one of the six best because she plays in a team where that kind of culture is what's emulated and what's honored and what's valued. And we get to control that. So some of the other examples that have come up, um, I've, I've had the good fortune of getting to know Steve Young, um, Hall of Fame quarterback, um, Super Bowl winner. I teach his son in philosophy class right now. And uh, he's written the foreword for my next book. The entire foreword is about accountability. Right? And, and he loves telling the story of when he, when he began as the starting quarterback for the 49ers, every time he threw an interception, he, he wanted to let the guys know what had happened. And there are very often real reasons, like slippery ball or the guy ran the wrong route or they switched their defense at the last second. And the team, he said, would just walk away until at one point he came to the sideline and said, guys, whew, I messed that up. I, great route, God, I threw it to the wrong guy. Let's get back out there. Make sure the next time on that route, I know where you're going. Let's get back out there and do it. And he was getting pats on the back and let's do it. It's a really simple thing, right? You see the through line of being, being able to be in control of the culture that you're creating here. And this happened in the national championship football game. The very first possession, starting quarterback of the number one team in the country through an interception. Nope. That's on me. There's Archimedes in the background. That's on me. First, play, first, first outing of the, uh, of the game. That's on me. Those guys are gonna, they're gonna follow that guy. That's, that's, that's a team with a culture of accountability. So one of the ways that we can do this, because as I mentioned, this is, it's gotta be a top-down thing. This cannot be you sitting and hoping the guys do this on their own. So putting your players in a situation where we fail and allowing us to come out of it. So when I started coaching, and I, I mentioned this Coronado trip, we, we took, take the team to Coronado, we train, we train, we play, we, we go for swims. We, um, I had set up a, Adam only comes to hear me say how he failed, it's amazing. <laughs> I have so much other good stuff to say. So, so we, um, but my first year there, I set up this uh, barbecue right on the bay with the girls' high school soccer team at Coronado. We had a really intense morning workout. It was 4th of July. I gave them the rest of the day off. Make sure you're at this address. You can walk everywhere in Coronado in 10 minutes. Be at this address at 4 o'clock. One guy showed up. And a good buddy of mine, his name's Doug Munns. He's on the national team, Navy SEAL. I said, Doug, I have massively failed. I'd only been at this for one year, so I was going into my second year. I said, we're on this great training trip, everything's going well, we're playing well, we won the section championships for the first time ever, but I have asked guys to be at a four o'clock barbecue. We're being hosted, food is being prepared for us by a high school girls soccer team, and one guy has showed up. So I'm not doing the job that I thought I was. I have a trophy but that's not the job I was trying to do. I need you, Doug, to take these guys down to the beach tomorrow morning 
and crush them. So we go down to the beach. Doug is sitting there in his fatigues. He's, got, he's covered in sand. The guys think they're going for a, a final day beach trip. <laughs> that part was a little painful to see. And we do probably close to the most intense three hours of physical training I've, I personally have ever done, not to mention these 16 and 17 year old boys. And at one point, the guy who showed up on time, he was actually, he, he had just moved into the area and he's coming out for the team. He was not, our, he was not a starter, let's put it that way. He's not, not one of our strongest players and he was having trouble assimilating to the team. So of course he's the one guy who shows up on time because everyone else is off at the beach together showing up late. And we're exhausted. We've been doing push-ups upon push-ups upon things in the water and building pyramids. And he says, who was on time yesterday? Dan raises his hand. Get down, push-up position, give me 20. And man, there's no way anyone's doing 20 push-ups. And Doug's yelling and screaming and Dan's hands are shaking. And at about his third push-up, gosh, I would give anything to have video footage of this. One of our... I'm putting this in quotes because he actually is cool, but was also a cool high school guy and a starter and a very strong player, went on to, to play and win a national championship at UCLA. Gets down next to him. Starts doing push-ups. Message received. That guy is now an integral part of our team. And that guy is now our leader. And now the whole team is down doing push-ups and we failed. I, I wasn't, I do it with them. I'm here shaking in the front. Um, I, none of us finished it, but I'm looking up at Doug and we're both kind of cracking a smile and we have all just perfectly failed together. And we go on to win the section championship that year. So uh, not just allowing for this, but finding safe, thoughtful ways to make this happen. And one way, and we've talked about taking emotional risks together, and again, this top-down approach, and I didn't do this intentionally. Um, this is, the parents made this, and I have to put it up. It's connecting philosophy and the myth of Sisyphus with water polo, and it's got our team goal, and this quote by Camus, and enjoying the struggle. But that really is, I mean, I sort of say it in a, as a caricature, but th this truly is, like this pretty much emulates, and the, my players know this, one of the things that, our program really values is the process. And so in getting to this, I have found through experience, and, and, I, and I will share that I'm almost willing to start doing this intentionally, but I won't need to, which I'll explain in a moment. This, if you're in any sort of relationship, which you are in, if you're coaching humans, goes so far. I realized this after having our first kids. So our kids are now eight, six, and four. But after year one, Jake's up all night screaming. Coach is irritable, shows up on deck. And I got a great group of kids. These guys, just as good a character and a culture as you could want, also successful. I get to practice, and I'm pretty sure, again, I'd be curious to see this one on video too. Uh, maybe 300 negative snarky comments. I'd be surprised if I said anything nice. And I got home and I felt awful. I was driving home, I said, oh my gosh, I can't like, I can't believe the way I just, whether they were nice kids or not, I cannot believe the way I just talked to those guys. And I, and I talked with Jessica, my wife, gosh, I feel awful, awful. And, and you know what, they just kept going. They kept going, they found strength in each other. They kept going, they kept going. They knew that I had a newborn. They kept going, they kept going. She said, tell them that. And I'm thinking like, but you know, male in society, you know, head of team must not admit fault. <laughs> male in household must not admit fault. And I was like, tell them like, like share, share this with them. And so I had a team meeting the next day. I said, guys, and I kind of explained what I just explained to you. And I said, I'm, I'm really sorry. You guys did not deserve that. And I, and I kind of went through it. And the captains came up to me after practice and they said, the guys have been talking about that all practice. We cannot believe that someone in your position would even apologize, not to mention the way you did it. We will follow you to the end of the earth. And I thought like, wow. And so now, as I said, <laughs> um, I, I sort of 
want to build this in every year, I found out that I don't have to, because I will naturally make mistakes along the way, as will you. And when you do, there's your culture of accountability. And it's risky, because they might laugh at you and they might say, oh, Jack's weak. That's weak. Why would he admit that? You don't, in our culture, you don't apologize. You don't admit failure. Well, for the last eight years on our program, thanks to Jessica, we do. And it is a much richer, much big picture program to be a part of. So this all then gets tied together with this. I, I mentioned Aristotle earlier. This is a, actually a paraphrase of him that's often wrongly attributed to him, but it summarizes him very nicely. That we're really here looking at process, not results. This has really been the theme of the entire morning, looking at process, not results. We all know the results are important, which is allowed. But looking at the process, and a great time to do this is when your team fails. You've run the play, his hips are up in the exact direction, you've got the shot blocker kicking off cross cage, goalie makes a great move, the opposing player buries a shot, and what does the coach of the team who just got scored on do? Fellas, great job, excellent shot block, really nice step there, Spence, you'll get it next time. Well done, fellas. We're, didn't that, who's, that coach just got, his team just got scored on. That wasn't well done. It was actually exactly well done. Here you can take it a step further. Guy made a great shot. <laughs> what? He just praised the other team. You're in charge of the culture, striving together. Actually, just yesterday, because the goalie's mom was sitting right here, I said, uh, very nice, Connor. The goalie made a ridiculously phenomenal save. And the goalie's mom kind of laughed at me. Because that's really what it's about. And then you can demonstrate that here. And yeah, your team's going to make mistakes that, you, that need to be corrected. That's why you practice. But here you are in a game, you've got a great chance to emulate process over results. And there's a couple really good quick snapshots. One of my favorites is this, which is borrowed from a baseball coach at our school. And I used to kind of mock this. He's, his, their culture, and it was a great team culture, when you make contact with the ball, you run a hard 90 from the plate to first base. And so sometimes right, the batter you know, would, would shank one and goes off of the bat back to the pitcher. Pitcher throws it to first base after the first two steps, and everyone has to wait for the guy to run as fast as he can to first base. And it's like, dude, you were out like five seconds ago. Like, and, why, and the people outside of the little society, what, what's, what's that guy doing? What is Joe doing? That's embarrassing. Why don't you just quit running? Because the point here is that if you're saying, oh, sometimes you don't have to go all out, but then sometimes you should, you have just told your athletes to focus on the results. Instead, phew, it alleviates a lot of gray area for a 16-year-old. When you hit the ball, you're going to run a hard 90. End of story. And I take this with my own kids when we're playing in the front yard. Even when they succeed, they hit the ball over the fence. I don't say, and again, this may seem like just semantics, but I don't say, nice home run, Jake. Nice swing. Right? It's the process, not the results. Wooden did this with the tying of the shoes. Um, I'm sure most of you by now have heard this great speech from this admiral, this Navy SEAL admiral who talks about making your bed in the morning. You think, what, Navy SEAL admiral? He's like fighting in the trenches. Like, he's like the gnarliest war, gnarly, the most uh, um, in intense war hero ever. He's talking about making your bed because it's a process. And again, we get to frame that. We do this on our team with this. This is it. Be your best. It's all over everything. If you ask a parent, if you ask someone at our school, a teacher, well, wonderful, what's it about? Be your best. Not be the best. This, this would actually almost be impossible for me. As I don't even know better than who. Like the US Olympic team, Harvard Westlake two years ago, the league team. Like how, how good is that team in our league? Pretty good. Okay, so we'll train kind of hard because we're just trying to win. We want to win league. 
train kind of hard. You wanna win states? Yeah, there's like 10 teams that are way better than you. Or you could, so train extra hard this year. All of that stuff is completely out of our control. There was one year we were arguably the best team in the state. I would have never thought to say, hey guys, this year we're gonna try to be the best team in the state. That was not even on my radar. And some years we have been not even close to winning the section championship because this team was just had a stacked year and we'd graduated everyone. And so again, to place your team's goals outwardly and externally and said, getting that trophy is our objective. Now you've shifted to results instead of process. How are we doing? Perfect. Um, and lastly, sort of in line with this, allowing yourself to be viewed under that same lens. The short story here is at um, the big Northern California tournament against Miramani. The Miramani player has the ball. Happy birthday, Coach Lynch. Thanks. And the Menlo player is trying to foul him. And in, while this is happening, the Miramani player commits an offensive. And as he's doing it, his head goes under the water for just a second. And the referee did, did. Nice whistle, by the way, for those of the referees conference, two whistles. But he doesn't hear the first one, and I can see that. Alex, drop back. It's the Miramonte player's free pass. I, I tell my Menlo player, drop back. It's the Miramonte player's free pass. And Alex is looking at me saying, like, I'm going to do what you're saying because you're my coach, but you know it's actually our ball. He just committed an offensive. The referee standing here like that. So the Miramonte player looks up at me, adjusts his cap, makes his free pass, gets ejected. I'm feeling pretty savvy. I just crushed that child, <laughs> right? Got right in his skull, mixed him up. And I sit down and Alec and Trevor, uh, we, we, think, we think what you just did was unethical. Are you, are you kidding? I pwned that guy, what? We all discuss on the bus ride home. And as the very, when I started writing this blog for Santa Clara's Institute of Sports Law and Ethics, my very first entry, Thou Shall Not Lie, Except Sometimes, The Morality of Deception in Youth Sports, my argument was that particular coach, a guy I once knew, acted unethically. He took advantage of his power position in a youth sports game as an educator in an interscholastic sport to cause that kid to fail, and thus is not honoring his competitor. It was a real mind shift for me, because I'm good at knowing what a 16-year-old's thinking and making him fail. And now I can't allow myself to do that anymore, because that is not under the auspices of what our program is about. Right? It's a weird thing to brag about, right? <laughs> Are you filming this? <laughs> so, and so we all sat on the bus ride home, and again, under the guise of sort of like of apologizing is me saying, gosh, you guys, you know what? A, Thank you for having that lens. Thank you for feeling comfortable enough to come to the, the coach and say that. And you're right. Like that, that was not an honorable way to treat one of our competitors. And I've got to apply that moving forward. So we have ethics as part of our team, team's culture. We discuss, uh, things come up weekly. Another, another team's Facebook page posts some information should we have access to that? Is that something that the other coach really wants us to have? The timeout lurking where the other team comes to half tank because they're allowed to and they're right next to your bench. Um, if, you, if you have this lens, you'll see something on a weekly basis. Again, relatively benign issues, but couched in those issues are justice and ethics and what it means to treat others with respect every single week in the culture of sport. Um, we discuss flopping, which is now and built into the rules, water polo, simulation, and pitch framing, and selling a sport. Coach Dedamonte has weighed in on the blog to, to talk about his thoughts on all of this. Um, and, and one thing that we do, again, it's a slightly semantic twist, we talk about earning a foul instead of drawing one. It's a small thing, but language is powerful, right? Drawing is turn and, oh, I hope the guy, you see them bounce the ball, I hope this guy fouls me, I hope the referee gives me a foul, oh, ref, he's foul, versus earning, making a water polo move, and earning a foul, and if he doesn't foul you, you have inside water. So not only better results, but we're using language that matches with our culture. We talk about intentionally losing. This, this topic, I, I am in the midst of being perplexed, and I have to figure it out because my editor is wanting a final draft. I'm not totally sure that I agree with the last four blogs that I've written. 
So for the players to see that you're in the midst of this process yourself and don't have all the answers, again, culture creation. And here we have that transmission of culture that I was talking about. Here are, this guy's going to Brown this year. This was his freshman year. This guy's going to UC Berkeley. He's the section player of the year. This guy's currently at Harvard, Brown, talking to seventh graders about our culture. And these guys are looking up, seeing how they're being treated by these big studs and the sport that they love. Culture is being transmitted and I'm not even out there. I'm off to the side sneaking a picture and setting up the balls to show that I'm not out here babysitting and making this happen. And so the last thing in my final minute, a really nice back of the mind lens. We talked a little bit, we, we heard, talked about a little bit evaluations, which I loved. And I think adding this to that, the 20 year rule. Because when we look at evaluations, one of the things I found to be gold, the senior bench player, the senior who never quite became a starter. What was his experience or her experience on your team? Very often, the goal scorers, the guys going to college, they scored all the goals, won all the games. They almost always have a pretty good experience. What's the guy who never started? What was his experience like? Because that's the guy that you want to make sure is getting everything out of your team experience that is there to be gotten. So the 20 year rule, coach, as though your athletes will evaluate you, not at the end of the season, nor upon graduation, but 20 years later. My own coach, Randy Burgess, he's off working with referees right now, was just interviewed after a ridiculous record. And look at the things that he focused on. He said, I'm absolutely overwhelmed by the men who have come through our program, truly defining the meaning of, what does he focus on? Commitment, accomplishment, success, humility. The exact things that I took away 25 years ago from playing for him. And we also won a bunch of games. In 20 years, the relevance of youth sports trophies and medals a coach has accumulated will be trumped by the collective experience of the hundreds of athletes one has coached. And so, yes, what they say after the season is important. I had a good time, bad time. We, we, we were our best, we weren't. It was hard, it was easy. But 20 years later, which I'm a year away from, so what are they saying? What did they take away? Because that's a mature person looking back with perspective saying, here's the evaluation of my experience on that team. And that's a really important thing I think for us to keep in mind. So I urge you, take the inspiration. As I mentioned this morning was, I, I left inspired, truly inspired. This is the kind of stuff that I find inspirational and we're in charge and you get to dictate it. Celebrate what you value, thank you. Two minutes over. <laughs> yep. A little bit. I was the assistant coach at Capo Valley for two years. That kicked things off. Um, <clears throat> but the real answer is no. I've not been the head coach of a girls program. But are you finding some of this maybe not translating? I guess I'm trying to get the rhetoric of your. Yeah. What's? Are the girls on the team? Uh, yes. I find we're having a real problem with, um, despite demonstrating what we feel is good behavior and exemplifying behavior that um, we're still having problems with our culture and cohesiveness and uh, we're wondering if it's just patience or multifactorial or mm. <laughs> um, this guy can you give me an example of the like what what this nefarious behavior Four or five girls who no matter what you do to create a, a unity environment right just don't like each other and they're not you know it's a little backbiting uh, and that sort of so when, when you try a technique, uh, we've tried several techniques that you've thrown out there that, that have worked for you, it doesn't seem to translate into that part of the, right. create that, it doesn't seem to make the connection of like, I'm gonna support that girl. Have you, how do you choose your captains? We, 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 we try to choose people with those values, but it's like game by game for the most part. Yeah. Who, this week, so you choose the captain. You have the right to be the captain. Oh. So you go out and you be the captain. I, I'm wondering if setting the stage early and saying, Here, here's what the captain of this team is. Here's, to pick Maggie, use Maggie Steppens. Like, here's, look at this woman and look, what, look at her core values. And we've been talking about this all weekend and would love for you, 
for girls to choose someone to be our leaders and have it start from there. Yeah. So I think, I think. Something like that might work. I'm, I'm doubtful that with this particular group of girls. Gonna get that. <laughs> yeah. I coach one girl. I don't have captains because I value leadership and I find that especially with women, there's different opportunities for leadership in different arenas. And so by choosing one captain, may set an example that somebody else may not agree with and they can't find commonality on it. I don't have captains because in different types of social and practice, different people can then arise to an occasion. I, I do, th and I, I actually think you can get the best of both worlds because I, I think one of the things that we get to do is teach leadership. Like with my goalies, and sometimes the goalie is this really mild-mannered goalie. I don't need him to be a rah, rah, let's go. Or you can say like, hey, here's a, here's a form of leadership that would work for you. And I do think it's really important to say to the, like the freshmen, like you guys are leaders on this team. I know you're new, but like you're a leader on this team as much as our captains are. And so now you've got elected leaders who emulate your core values and everyone else learning what leadership actually means that it's not necessarily an elected position. So that might be a good start. Yeah. When you strive together and invite, invited the inclusion from Coronado to dinner, um, is that before or after the game? After. We do that about three times a year. We did it with Davis last year, San Ramon Valley, um, Matt Swanson's team. Have you ever asked for a team to say no? No. Because, this is a great follow-up, I schedule our opponents with this in mind. And occasionally we meet up with a team that does not behave this way, and I do my best to never play them again. Where I, you know, I played, we played Mass Swanson's teams last year knowing they were one of the top teams in the country. They beat us, and we, we set up lunch afterwards. Like, we both knew we were going into a battle. And it's, so the answer is it's never been bad. It's, it's actually always, because I know the coaches of the programs, I'm seeking them out specifically, Terry at Davis and Matt and Burgess, and saying, and afterwards, we'd love to host you. And now Matt, Matt said, well, this is awesome. Can we host you next year? Absolutely. And we're making it, you're not just sitting, you know, Menlo here and Coronado over there. Like, it's integrated. So, so no, it's never been, there's never been anything remotely negative as a result. Have we got time for one more? Or do you kind of answered it, but I, I was just gonna ask at what age range would you choose a captain, for example, a 14 year old? Are they too young to have a captain? Or hmm. That's a great question. That, to me, it seems like, knowing the personnel. I, I personally think it's okay to start that early and say, hey guys, like we're in this together, we need someone to talk to the referees on your behalf and, you know, and, and if there's something happening, you know, the captain's gonna come to me, the coach, and just explain it in much more simplified terms so that everyone's, and we're having that conversation about leadership and the, like, the non-captains, how they're getting to be leaders in their own 12-year-old way. Yeah. The best part about this is I just don't want to take time away from us talking about this because it brings more questions than answers, right? Yeah, no, for sure. Questions that are up. So thank you, Jack. Yeah, thanks, man. You always do a great job. It's awesome. Really appreciate it. Thank you.